go, next to the big man. My name's Jonathan Alley. Thank you for joining us tonight, live in the Triple R Performance Space or on the air at 102.7. Tonight, we have a guest who has, uh, for me personally, completely succeeded in engaging my mind and provoking me for the better part of the last 30 years. He has an ever-yearning mind and is somebody who ha maintains an intellectual interest in those around him, which I find never fails. He also has extremely passionate, yearning and articulate ears for music, which has turned me on to a million different bands, which in Relay I have played back to you many times over the last 30 odd years of radio. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, on Triple R, Mr. Henry Rollins. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Oh, no problem. Through all the activities that you've undertaken over the years, uh, be it music, publishing, writing, uh, acting, these speaking engagements and, and the ensuing recordings uh, have been a constant over the last 30 years or so. Why is getting up and, and speaking to people of these engagements so important to you personally? I feel a genuine need to communicate with an audience, and it might just be uh, the, the attention I didn't get as a kid. I, it can't come from anything good. Uh, but what I try and do is bring the best information I can to the stage and, uh, and broadcast it. So I'm, I'm, it's reportage from distant points, from uh, a fairly unique standpoint. Uh, and so basically I, I'm not keeping it all to myself. But I, I earnestly try to, it's not about entertainment. It's about communication, warning, broadcasting, emitting, and trying to leave something of myself with these, with the audience. Not, it's not mere entertainment. It's not just making people laugh or not. It's, uh, it's got to hurt me. It's got to leave lines in my face. I don't like any artistic endeavor that doesn't extol a price on the one doing it. So I don't, I'm not looking to get through these things okay. These things are actually very difficult and uh, very hard on my psyche, which makes me think I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. Thank you. The Rollins Band, uh, I mean, barring the reunion you did with, with Sim Cain and Melvin Gibbs and Chris Haskett in 2006, finished in 2003. Now, I, I mean, appreciate for you, it's very much in the rear view. But, but what a band. Uh, since then, you, you have stepped into the studio on occasion with, with the Mark of Cain from Australia, with, yeah. with Le, Le Butcherettes, which is a collaboration I enjoyed enormously. Uh, an incredible track, which I checked out online a couple of days ago with Thor, called The Master of Revenge, which I love. You can't say no to Thor. I'm, sure, I'm so glad you didn't. It's a fantastic no, He's tune. a great guy. But, but just coming out this week is something you've recorded with Ruts DC. Yeah. Tell uh, me about that. Well, Ruts DC is uh, Segs and Ruffy and a, a guy named, well, um, I should explain. There, there was a great punk rock band called The Ruts. No doubt you've heard them. If you haven't, you should run and not walk to that. Uh, half the band has passed away. And so bravely, the rhythm section, uh, Ruffy on drums and Segs on bass, they've carried on as Ruts DC. DC standing for DeCapo, a new beginning. And they have incorporated Lee Haggerty on guitar Tar, who's a wonderful guy and a longtime fan of the band. And they do new songs and old songs from back in their punk rock days. And they've just finished a new album. And they're longtime pals of mine and heroes to me. And they asked me to sing on this record. And they asked me in January when I was hanging out with them in London, they came to my show. And I said, of course, yeah. And so we, I did the vocal in Los Angeles. And I sent it to them and it seemed to pass muster. And I was in Scotland recently, and we, Segs and I did the video together, just, you know, with a, a Canon uh, camera, you know, just kind of a low-budget affair. And, and that's it. And I did it because they asked me, but I am not looking to get back in the record business. No. I, I just did it because I was asked. It wasn't like, I'm going to make a record. I'm like, had they not asked me, I don't ever think about making music. Really? You don't yeah. miss it at all? No, uh, just because I did it so completely. Uh -huh. uh, I have no more questions to ask. There's no more lyrics in me. And that was the thing that happened. I woke up one morning and I went, wow, 
I'm done. It was a, a very strange thought. It was like someone had placed it mm -hmm. in my brain. Yeah, but what about that visceral thrill? I mean, you know, when you're in the studio with the Mark of Cain, for example, who to me are just one of the, our premier live bands. Absolutely. The energy of that yeah. band is remarkable. When that hits you, doesn't it go, oh, that feels good? Yeah, but so does overeating and sleeping late. <laughs> and, 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 and so my choice was I can go out and have that, you know, theme park ride mm. playing old music, but that's artistically cowardly to me. It's relying on past achievements. And so when I stopped doing music, my, since I had no new material with which to risk failure and have an audience go, you know what, this sucks, we don't like it, which is what I want. I want you to dig what I'm doing now, not squint when you watch and go, well, I, I'm pretending it's 20 years ago. And a lot of bands, they go out and they play their old songs and they get by like what Mick Jagger's doing this year. Mm. And I'm not putting it down. I don't want to do it. And so I can't go on stage and play old material because it's not risking anything. Like, but people want you to do it. Mm, that remains to be seen. But I, I just, I, I don't want to do it. And in 2006, uh, Chris Haskett of the Rollins Band, wonderful guy, married an amazing, uh, brilliant Australian woman. Uh, he said, hey, me and the guys want to get the old band back together. And I said, uh, why? And they, you know, were feeling their wallet, I think. And so I went out to New York and inspected it, them. And uh, I said, it sounds good. And then I got sucked into it. And after the first show, I'm like, oh, no, a month of this. And it was a month of going out and doing that thing for an hour. It wasn't fake. It just wasn't in the moment. As I say, very, very much appreciate the Rollins Band or the, all those experiences very much in the rear view. Yeah. You. It, my, my question more related to, I guess, that visceral thrill of, of standing on a stage, whether it's those guys or, or any band. But it's interesting, you say, you know, that you feel like... But if it's not real, you got to exactly. walk... Yeah, yeah uh, I, I know, I the, because the visceral yeah. part, yeah. that's always there. Yeah. Whenever I, I watch other bands, I'm just like... Because <sighs> that's in me. Yeah. And I, I just want to go like, man, I'll show you something. Um, yeah. I sang with Dinosaur Jr. last December because they asked me. I did a song, Don't, which only has why, why don't you like me, so even I could get the lyric. But I, I did it because Jay asked me, and I, I, I don't want to disappoint those guys. And I remember afterwards, they all came up to me like, that was really intense. I'm like, this, what other way do you do it? Especially with those guys, with Dinosaur Jr. Oh, there was, with Jay, being yeah. on stage with Jay was, uh, was just all of them. But that, that much guitar volume, I, yeah. that was something else. So I'm a fan, big fan of that band. But um, yeah, all of that is still there. Yeah. But if you're not, but if what you're pushing forward isn't all the way real, then if it's 98% real, then the 2% that you're lying to the crowd Shame on you. I can't do that. This is hallowed ground for me. And so if it's not 100%, I sadly have to walk away. And my bandmates didn't take the, when I, when I stopped playing, they didn't take it well. Management didn't take it well. I said, fellas, I'm done. And they're like, well, I go, I know, I know. Go get a job. Because <laughs> it's, it's no longer with me. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't. And they, they understood. They just weren't ha happy about it. Look, you know. As you say, you did a fair tour of duty, and uh, they're great musicians. I, I love yeah, watching and good that people. Lineup. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and but you have to be honest up here. Yeah, uh, really, that's more important than anything. So you have acted in various roles here and there over the years, but recently you were in a film called He Never Died, which yeah. I saw recently, and I thought your performance was was bang on perfect. Thank you. Now, Jason. No. Uh, Krozik? Krofcek. Krofcek. Yeah. Thank you. I've had to, I have, I've yeah. had to learn that one phonetically. It's uh, yeah. the Polish last name where there's lots of C's and Z's and K's. And you're like, Jason, please help me. He, he wrote and directed the film and yeah. what he approached you specifically for the role? He, yeah. He uh, uh, in the end of 2012, I was in New York about to start a week of shows. And Heidi, my boss at the office, my manager, the big boss of 20 years, she wrote me and she said, read this screenplay right now. Uh -huh. Because she, if she read it and liked it, I know I'll like it because she, she knows me. She goes, you're going to love this. Like, read it. I sat in a freezing backstage area and I read the whole thing. And I wrote her. I said, this is amazing. I, I can do this. She goes, oh, I know you can do it. The director and the producer are in New York. They want to meet you. How about tomorrow at noon? I'm like, done. So I met Jason and Zach, the director and producer, respectively. And I said, I, 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 I can do this. And Jason said, I wrote it for you. 
Wow. And I went, oh, come on. Who did you want really? And he went, no, no, I wrote this with you in mind. I said, I can, I really can do this. He goes, oh, I know you can. Are you in? I said, yeah. And then they, Zach said, well, I'll go out and get the money to make this. I went, sure you will. Yeah, but uh, he did. He, they did it. Yeah. He said, we're going to dangle your name out and we'll get money. I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> and they did. They did. They did. And 11 months later, uh, we shot it. And I took that almost that entire time preparing. Yeah. And Jason and I micromanaged every scene. We were sitting in a production office, knee to knee, with the script, just making notes. I go, look, I think Jack does this in this scene. Mm -hmm. And he goes, okay, why? I go, because of this. I just made up this idea that Jack did this before. And we really worked on the character. Uh, I was an executive producer on the, on the film, so I helped cast it. I helped um, with the soundtrack. And uh, now it, the film is doing very well, and there's talk uh, of, of doing part two, which I is already a written. series was the other thing I Yes, had. Uh, and a series was written, yeah. and, and we pitched it till our arms were sore. Yeah. And we all, also, Zach, uh, Jason rather, wrote part two, which is rumored to be in play with a uh, massive streaming service. Uh, I won't mention because the ink's not dry, but there's a very good chance we'll be doing He Never Died Part 2, whatever Jason's going to call it next year. Brilliant. But I'll, I'll believe it when I, I'm on the set. I want to take you back a step. You, you were talking about, you know, the 100% experience and everything being completely, you, you know, genuine. Yeah. And that it's got to hurt a little bit. Yeah. The role, did it do that? Yeah. Uh, I went deep in on that. Uh, mm. He's a very bad guy. Tell us a little bit more about him. For well, um, it, it, the, the, the film is about a man named Jack who can't die. And the reasons he can't die are really, really cool. Jason's brilliant. I won't kill it for you. So that's funny. Can't kill me, so I can't kill the story. But no, I won't tell you why, because you, you should watch the film and find out. It's free on Netflix. Anyway, um, it's a really great reason why he can't die. He has a very bad past. So he's been alive for centuries. And it assaults the idea of longevity. Like, I, I don't want to die tomorrow. I'm not look, I wouldn't want to get hit by a streetcar. But the idea of living, being like 1,100 years old, 1,200 years old, some people might go, yeah, really? You, you, want, you want centuries of this? Mm -hmm. like, and, and that's how I went at the part where Jack is clinically depressed. And anyone who tries anything with him, if someone pulls a gun and he's just like, no, don't, it just, it just gives me headaches when you shoot me in the head. Because he's been in every war, he's done hundreds of years of jail time, he's been in every possible relationship with a woman, he's maybe dated Cleopatra, I mean, you don't know what this guy's gone through. And there's one scene in the film where a waitress takes a liking to him because he's strange. And she says, so what do you do? And he, it's like three pages of jobs he's had. <laughs> And we shot That's that right. on the freezing streets of Toronto. We just memorized, me and this amazing actress, Kate Greenhouse, we memorized, I had to memorize three pages of job descriptions. And we're going down Young Street, very popular main drag in Toronto. And people are watching us make this film. So people are driving by, Henry! Back to one. <laughs> and yeah. Or people like waving out of restaurants, like back to one. And meanwhile, our faces are freezing. And finally, we just put up a sheet between us and the street. An old man got under the sheet, walked next to us. Like, Are you, you all making a documentary? We're like, well, we were making an independent film that we can't afford to shoot all night. And thank you, sir, for making our lives so much better. But um, <laughs> uh, Jack is very depressed, and he's very aware of his awfulness, what he's done. Because uh, what he needs, how he survives. He's had time to think it's, about it's, it. He's a, he's a monster, yeah. and so I took all that in and it informed every everything you see me do in that film. There's nothing. I knew everything I was doing, and I tried to make it as awful as I could, just to, to make the care, the monster aspect of this guy, you know, and the hell that he's trapped himself in mm. with immortality. Before we move on, just quickly, tell me a little bit about uh, God of Damarung, which featured Lemmy and Iggy Pop and yourself. Yeah, uh, and beautifully shot in black and white. Yes, beautiful. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Gutter Damarung, uh, with a G, G U, Gutter Damarung, not Gutter Damarung, the Wagnerian piece. Gutter Damarung is a, is a film that concepted by a guy named Bjorn Tegmos. And Bjorn came up to me, I think, in either Belgium or Sweden. He lives in both countries, so I'm forgetting where he pitched me. He goes, I've, I've had this idea for a film. I I've got like a scene written, but here's the whole storyboard in comic book form, there's images, 
a guitar is thrown down to earth and creates rock and roll, and it sets up the, be, the battle of good and evil. The religious right wants the guitar, but rock and roll wins in the end and, and all this stuff. And I said, wow, that's really cool. He goes, I want you to be in it. I said, okay, interested, and I want you to write it. And I go, write a screenplay? And he said, yeah. I said, I, I, I've never written a screenplay. Well, this will be your first one. So I said, oh, I don't know how to approach it. He goes, well, here's a, here's a, a, a scene on a kind of storyboarded out, written, and um, would you give it a shot? I went, yeah, wh why not? I go, look, if it's not good, you'll tell me, right? And he goes, like, fair enough. And so while I was doing He Never Died, Monday through Friday, I was writing Gutter Demrong on the weekends. And I wrote it. I wrote the whole damn screenplay. I mean, Bjorn put in some parts, with me, and it's his story. But he'd give me the scene, and I'd punch it up. And he shot it. I mean, I, I can't believe it. It's done. <laughs> and it's, it's really good. He's a fashion photographer. So he, he photographs yeah. like eight-foot-tall women in Brazil and then to Paris. And then, you know, he's one of those very high-priced guys. But also, he's a wicked eye for composition. If you, if you want, you just type in Gutter, Damarong, and he Rollins, and you'll see the trailer. You'll see what he's getting at. It's gorgeous black and white. Oh, so good. Um, Iggy is in it. Lemmy is in it. Uh, Grace Jones is in it. Josh Homme. Uh, we have members of uh, the Eagles of Death Metal are in it. Uh, Grace Jones plays Death, and she's... What else? Uh, she's <laughs> stunning. Uh, I met her the other night uh, in London. She was, uh, she's something else. Uh, she's a real. She's got more charisma than uh, I think I've ever seen in one person. Yeah. It was one of the last things Lemmy ever did was be in Gutter Demerang, and uh, yeah, yeah. I was there to, to wrangle him because he'll do one take and leave. And so Bjorn says, "Would you be on set to make sure he stays?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll be there." And after one take, I'm leaving. I go get back to the tape. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we should. You have lived. I mean, you know. You met Johnny Cash in the presence of Joe Strummer. The both of us together were introduced yep. to Johnny by Rick Rubin. You've been hugged by James Brown. Yeah. You had lunch with David Bowie. Lou Reed rang you up at your... Do you ever just pinch yourself and go, I used to work in an ice cream store and join, joined a band and now... Yeah. Like, do, do you have that moment still? Yeah. Or are you used to this? Sure. Oh, no, you never get used to it. I, I've had a, a pretty... Uh, interesting ride and what i try and do with it is not uh hide it and you know tell the stories yeah. but not in a i'm superior because i'm just some guy any, from anywhere it doesn't matter uh I, i've just had a, an interesting uh a interesting slice of experience yeah but yeah just a basically a lucky bastard <laughs> and uh i just as the older i get the thing that's more forefront in my mind is just gratitude mm. whereas a younger person you're like you, you know, big head of steam. Uh, the older I got, I saw how lucky I was to have a prolonged life in it, the entertainment biz. A lot of my peers yeah. don't have, they're not having the be the best time all the time. Well, you've pulled the, well, I won't say trick, but you've you've achieved what so many of us want to do, which is make make a living out of being you. Yeah, and so I, lucky to do. that yeah. I do, and it's uh, it's a hell of a thing. But you've used it well. I mean, you, you know, you've you've gone off to some places that most of us will, will never ever visit i believe this tour you've incorporated slides and visuals into some of the appearances yeah i did Tell two i did two slideshows um it, it's an idea that heidi my manager who's also you know she's been at my company for 20 years she's mm -hmm. the smart one and she sees all these photos because she helped me e edit my first photo book and so she's seen these photos i show her everything when i get back to the office and so she said you're going to do a tour of, and we're going to call it slideshow, and I did it at the at the National Geographic Theater. I did it at the Annenberg Institute in Los Angeles. It went down really well. C-SPAN broadcasted it, and uh, it's probably online. You can watch for free. And so my agent here uh, said, "You got a couple of nights off here in Australia. You got anything else you can do?" I go, "I got this slideshow thing," mm. and Tim said, "Send me some photos from it." I go, "Well, here." I sent him like ten photos. He went, "Oh, that'll work." And so what I did the other night in Sydney and what I did the other night in, uh, where was it, Brisbane, uh, is what I'm going to do as a full tour at some point. Hope, and, and there's no way I'd leave out Australia. I'd never leave out Australia. And so I'm thinking maybe 2018, because 2017 will probably be pr pretty busy. But 2018 or maybe around then. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay. And there are shots from Iraq, Afghanistan, North Korea, all over the African continent, Central yep. Asia, the Middle East. Uh, Southeast Asia, like Burma, Vietnam, Laos, mm -hmm. uh, Cambodia, uh, South America, Easter Island, Antarctica, 
uh, all over. You have, as you've just said, traveled incredibly widely, but also incredibly often. Now, the US, particularly the people who live between the two coasts, mm. who, who live in the exterior, rightly or wrongly, they have quite an insular, well, a reputation for a certain insularity. Sure. Now, a lot of Americans have that. But you're one of the most least, uh, the least insular American I know of, I, I think. Um, when you go back there, and you see, you know, you have these on-ground realities. You you know what happens in other people's countries. Do you find, no matter how well-meaning they are, the everyday life of the American person? Do you find that frustrating? I I, I see. I wish everyone had the means to travel. Mm. I, I wish if I if I had my way, everyone would be magically gifted with like five grand. So when they graduate from high school, they can go backpacking across Europe or go to you know Costa Rica or just have an experience in a different culture. And, and I go all over the world. I, fi I find Australians everywhere I go. You all are some very traveling people, like really <laughs> adventurous. Like I've been like in... Yeah. Uh, in uh, you, uh, where is it? Mali, on my way to Timbuktu, and there's Australian backpacker kids. I'm like, how'd you get here? We thumb, we thumbed here from Senegal. I'm like, wow! I wouldn't go near a trip like that. And they're tanned, and they're just like, they're just having the time of their lives. Especially not now. I mean, the, the north of the country. Yeah, well, this is this is a few. This is like yeah. 2009, right. and now so it's, a, it's a no go. It's definitely yeah, no, no go. Timbuktu is bad off. But now. how great's the music from Mali? Fantastic. Well, that's why I went. I went yeah. there twice for the Desert Music Festival to oh, see like right. uh, Tunari Wen and yep. Tartit and uh, Tara Keft and Kua Dede and people like that in in their environment uh, with mm -hmm. like 3,000 other backpacker world music fans. And I went two years in a row. And I think m the last year I went was like the last year they had it because it's now everyone's armed and everyone's shooting at each other and they can't. The year I went, some people, some tourists got abducted. Mm -hmm. Some Italian tourists were abducted and some Saudi Arabian travelers, I think, were shot and killed. And so uh, a lot of the British people who wanted to go, their flights were canceled out of Heathrow because of the... And I got out of America. They, weren't, they, they wanted Americans to stay home, but I, I went. So. Henry, we have gotten to that point of the evening. I have to ask you this, this question. Um, to me, the fact that, that Donald Trump is the Republican nominee and could yet still be your president. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a kind of logical endpoint of the fact that America elected a B-grade actor in 1980. And this is a sort of end phase. I, I think it's because of that. Yeah. It yeah. Very well, look. You know, we went through eight years of Reagan, twelve years of somebody, somebody called Bush. Yeah, and and we could yet still be landed with with Donald. To me, what I want to ask about that is not so much uh, about what you think about Donald Trump. It's more what does that reflect about the U.S.? What is it about this kind of populism over policy that seems to triumph, particularly in the last twenty five years? I think there's at least a few things in play. Uh, there's, there's probably a whole lot because humans are tricky. Uh, you have at least a few decades of a very conscientious, concerted effort to dumb down the electorate. Why? Because uh, there's certain people who make a lot of money when uh, America goes to war okay. and when America fills prisons. And so we have the, this overflowing prison population. And every time a convict is, spends a year in prison, that's between fifty dollars and $150,000 of my taxpayer dollars to keep him in cheese sandwiches and orange jumpsuits. Also, uh, with all these companies that uh, make weapons and weapons delivery systems, you need people to fill those battlefields. And so our export item, our version of democracy, usually comes with drone strikes, uh, it seems to these days, and foreign policy that comes back to bite us later, like ISIS, yeah. the Taliban, uh, etc. And, and you need dumb people to go, hell yeah, the, the Saudis got us, we're going into Iraq. We're like, how are you making that work? And all you get told is, shut up, communist. You're like, sure, man, you got it. And so it's, it, you have a very uh, wide demographic of Americans who are very coarse. They don't travel. They don't have passport. Why do I need a passport? Gee, like travel wouldn't help you. 
Uh, they, so they, don't, they, they think all these countries are full of people who just scratch in the dirt and they couldn't be more wrong. And they don't think their chi- they, these people don't love their children like they love their own children. And so that's one thing that's at work. Also, in the last, uh, last several years, at least since the Bush two to now, you have a Congress that's not reflective of, of the people who elect, put them in office. So you, you have yeah, we know a, a non-transparent. Mm. Well, I think a lot of democracies suffer from a lack of transparency. Mm. What's in the paperwork is total transparency. I vote for you. You do what I, I that you said you were going to do that got me into you in the first place. We are your boss. Right. Well, no one remembers that. Right. And so especially the politicians. And in America, you don't have so much a democracy. You have a corporatized democracy where left and right both serve bigger corporate concerns, just like you have a news media that goes for ratings over information. Mm. And that's why you're not getting reported to on global climate change and these things like it with full velocity. So uh, a guy like Donald Trump is almost smacks of a guy with candor because he comes in like hey this guy's a jerk let's find his center you want his phone number he just like shows you lindsey graham's phone number that's kind of funny but everyone goes like wow what an upstart he's like punk rock he's the bull in the china closet he's a failed reality show guy with a bunch of really awful hotels with no taste and in foreign policy he would be an unmitigated disaster but you have a lot of really angry americans who a hate a, a black president hate the idea of a female president because the only thing america rocks with racism we're fantastic racists but the only thing that ex- exceeds and eclipses our Racism is our misogyny. Like, we, we kick ass at misogyny. And so a black guy who is smarter than everyone's entire bloodline just did eight years of a presidency. They hated that. And now there's the threat of a woman who the uh, America hates that woman. Uh, Hillary Clinton's been hated for decades. At least she knows it, and she won't waste time if she gets into office thinking Republicans will ever be her friend, like Obama did for the first two years of his administration. Interesting. He reached across the aisle and got his hand bitten off. Um, So what you have is a a country that both sides angry at Congress, both sides not getting bang for their buck. Trump, uh, he works on that anger, and he really milks it. And he, you know, a lot of veiled, you know, all that weird stuff he says about the Second Amendment and yeah. veiled threats. Do you think there's a complacency in the U.S.? And uh, there's a, seems to be a school of thought that he won't. There's, he doesn't have a chance. He won't get in. He, he has a, full, a huge chance. I think a lot of people too. will sit home. Yeah. And that's how you got all the Tea Party people in the midterm elections because the young people sat home. That's how you got Brexit. A lot of people sat home. So inactivity in my country. In beautiful Australia, it doesn't serve you. And if you you want to get something you don't want, sit home on election day. Like, how yeah. dare you? Uh, and and I, I, I vote. Uh, sometimes I have to vote from the road. I have to, like, mail it in because I'm on tour. Yeah. But I do it. And I, I've been doing it for years. I, do, I love dropping that, that thing in and, and getting my I voted sticker. I put them on my computer monitor. I have rows of them. It's just a fun day to, you're like, damn, I did that. It's, it's a great feeling like you won something. It's, you know, I, I relate to what you're saying because it's ridiculous here. We have compulsory voting and people resent it. It's like, oh, well, I've, I've voted the fine. Yeah, I don't know. In America, it. we're used to being told, like, you can be uh, functionally illiterate, yeah. uh, still get a credit card. Like, they'll, they'll put them into your dead or mouth. Gun. Oh, both. Yeah, they'll, they'll hand them over to you. You can be upside down on your house, not get kicked out of it. Mm. And everyone will tell you, you're exceptional. And you come from the greatest country in the world. But what about the drone strike? Oh, no, well, you know, that's collateral damage. What about the fact that we lost the Vietnam War? Fighting words. What about the illegal invasion and occupation of Iraq? But we're still the greatest. How can you be the greatest and have ra- this much racism and this much poverty? doesn't look that great to me. And so meanwhile, you're being told relentlessly, you are exceptional. That's a problem in America. For the people listening, I'm, I'm holding up the Think Tank album that Henry Parsley recorded in Australia and released in 1998, or around then. The liner notes, which I always enjoy reading, the last line is, rejoice, we will destroy racism in our lifetime. And at the time this came out, as in my late 20s, I read that and I thought, you know, he's probably right. It, these things take time. It won't happen overnight, you know, but history is the long game. You know, we are making progress. Since then, I see Trump wanting to build a wall. I see the rise of the right again in in Europe. I see Pauline Hanson elected, rejected, re-elected to our Senate. Uh, I see rioting, you know, in our our neighborhood up up five kilometers up the road. And I think, well, you know, will we? 
What causes racism in, in your estimation? What is at the core of it? Uh, one of the things is, of course, a lack of education, mm -hmm. ignorance, poverty, and the ability of, of one group of people to blame another group of people for their problems. And uh, Donald Trump is very good. That, that's what Make America Great Again, this, his slogan, mm. Make America Great would be a great slogan. Let's make America great. I can pitch in, you can pitch in, we can all get, get together. Let's make America great again implies that someone took it. Someone took the greatness. Who was it? Brown-skinned people, black people, Asian people, illegal people, mm. mouthy women, and gays. They took, they, they took the greatness, and Donald Trump's going to bring it back, so we got to build the wall, etc. Racism came into my country from people torn from their, their homelands, like in Angola and wherever, dragged to America and put into slavery. And that set up a class system that America has never recovered from. We, our racism is alive and well. And I wrote those liner notes in that record that, we, that you kindly read a moment ago. Will we overcome racism in my lifetime? I don't think so. And I sadly have come to the conclusion that we shall not overcome. Mm. And that's why I'm done with the idea of we. I'm only interested in individuals. I'm interested in what you're going to do, what you're going to do, you, 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 you. We, we drone strike. We rape. But you, on the other hand, can reject all of that and radiate that. And if you have kids, you make sure that they don't either. And that's the only way that things get better is individuals rejecting this stuff. But we, homo sapiens, we're a very mean species. Yeah, you're in it's interesting. You know, I, I have a feeling you're not a religious man. No. Neither am I. I'm not putting it down. Is this no, not for Well, me? no, no not, a, not in the least. Yeah. But what you've done by saying that is actually an essentially religious idea. You know, Christ also will put your own house in order. You know, a guru might say, well, for the forest to be green, each tree must be green. It comes down to whether you believe in a big man in the sky or not. I don't. But essentially, it's you sort it out. It's what it comes down to. Well, you know how it is to be an adult. I can't oh, allegedly. <laughs> well, you know what I mean? I can't convince you of anything. No. no like, no. if you think there's no such thing as global climate change and that's your POV, there's nothing, there's no data I'm going to bring you that's going to change your mind. We adults, we know we're right. Yeah. And so I don't bother with adults because, like, I'm, you, you, I'm not, I don't have seven minutes to waste on this guy to get no. called names. And, and so he's... I, we, he and I, we can't be we. I can't hang with him. I got to be good for me. And I'm not saying being selfish. Like me, me, me. I'm like, I got to take care of my own thing. And if I can help you, man, I will. Hmm. But we don't get it done. I get it done. Our, I YouTube you a lot. And in, 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 uh, <laughs> There's a lot of me up there. Isn't there is, there? there yeah, is a lot. lot. And one thing that interested me, I was preparing for this. Um, some years ago, you took part in an English television program with a psychiatrist called Oliver James. And he was this vaguely egg, very pleasant, vaguely egg-headed kind of Eno-esque man. And he said, Henry, um, you know, if you could be Gandhi, John Lennon, Einstein or Muhammad Ali, who would you be? And you hesitated. And after a while, you decided Muhammad Ali was, cool. was the... But, <laughs> Oh, absolutely. What a man. What I mean, a man. This is before he died. But I did want to ask you, if, if a black athlete in 2016 joined the Nation of Islam and then refused the draft, what would the reaction be? He might catch a bullet in the head. Yeah. I mean, what's what, one of the most amazing aspects of Muhammad Ali is that no one shot him. Because uh, forget the stuff he was saying, doing in the ring. Yeah. The stuff he was saying, and there's like videos and documentaries where you can watch what he's saying at universities. You're like, oh no, they're going to get him. I mean, he was so right and outspoken and sp speaking up for so many people mm. uh, of all races. I mean, that's why he's a, a, a global hero. Him, Abraham Lincoln, and Ian MacKay are like my three favorite Americans. And uh, I only got to meet one of those, but uh, I, I felt really awful when Muhammad Ali passed away because he was a guy who really looked it right in the eye when it, the stuff he was saying when he was saying it. Yeah. Black guys got killed for less in America day and night, mm. still to this day. He's kind of a miracle in a lot of ways. I'm an avid listener to your radio show. On Sunday night, we're on the radio. You, you you miles go. away and you still get to do it. But uh, the shows, I've, I mean, I enjoy all of them. Uh, but the shows I've enjoyed, particularly when you have guests on, and you know, the show with King Buzzo, yeah. talking about Sam Peckinpah's girlfriend, the golf lady. And, and playing live Judy Garland records. Yes, yeah. they were great. I'm still getting letters about that. Why, Henry, why? <laughs> but when Ian comes on, yeah. every now and again, 
it's so there's this familiarity that's exuded 44 years of friendship well that's it now obviously there's music at the core of that what else is at the core of that yeah i love the guy yeah uh, he's an amazing man i've watched him go from squeaky voiced boy to a father right. and to watch this guy you know create discord records help invent the washington dc music scene and right. the five dollar ticket and the six dollar lp and to stick to his guns and keep his integrity over decades is an extraordinary thing his wife's amazing the kid is going to be a marvelous pain in the ass because he's a lot like Ian. He's stubborn, man, and just like will not shut up. He's an amazing young man, a uh, really gorgeous little boy named Carmine. And, uh, he, and the, Ian's wife is like this brainiac. Uh, she, she's in the evens with Ian. She's yep. the drummer in the evens, Amy. Yep, yep, yep. But he's just he's this Amy extraordinary yeah. guy, yeah. And I, I'm, he's my younger, older brother. He's the sensible one. And we've both had lives in music and out in the world, and we've gone at it completely differently, like very mm -hmm. differently. Uh, many things I do, he would never do. Like, he'll never be in a magazine that has alcohol in it, you know, where there's alcohol advertisements. Like, that's why he won't be in Rolling Stone. I'll go on the cover of Rolling Stone right now. I write for Rolling Stone Australia. You do? Yeah, yeah. every month for like five or six years now. And so I, I do, I ride a bit, a different wave than Ian, but we're both in the same sea, if that makes any sense. It makes complete sense. Yeah. No, I, um, I've been to the Discord site and bought all the Fugazi shows that I went to, played them on the radio. Labor yeah. of Love, that website. Oh yeah. Hundreds and hundreds of Fugazi shows, took Ian years to put that together. But so worth it. Totally. Especially yeah. if you were there, you know, to be able to just five some bucks. Of the and best, then... Some of the best live shows I've ever seen was that band. Oh yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, You've, I mean, it's, uh, as I was saying, Sunday night, you're on the radio. You've always played a lot of Australian music on your yeah. show. But but lately, um, there's been this uh, a wave of fantastic stuff, including uh, a session with Julia Wilson from Rice's Night. Yeah, Julia's a buddy of mine. She's yeah. just a great human being. And she's in L.A. a lot for business. Right. And, you know, I, I pick her up wherever she's staying. We drive around. I, yeah. I, I take her to my place and DJ in front of her. And she likes the music I'm playing. So she comes by. And uh, she was in L.A. like, what, last year? Everyone. For like weeks. And I said, why don't you come in and like take over the show with all of your cool Australian music? She went, all right. And we did that show. It's yeah. killer. We had Sarah Mary Chadwick here, and you know, she's the, amazing. The space, and actually, yeah. Summer Flake as well. Yep, we, we another had an amazing artist. Yeah, it's, well, it's great. I mean, when I'm listening to you, it's like, oh, it's almost surprising when you play non-Australian artists. Now it's like, oh, that's right, he plays. You well, know? I, I have to make a disclaimer sometimes. Yeah. I go, folks, I, I'm. I, I don't have any stock in Australia. No. Uh, I, I, it's not a publicly <laughs> traded company, and I know tonight's show is sixty percent Australian music. It's just the new records that came in, they're all from Australia, and unsurprisingly, they're all good. They're so, all really good. So, yeah. you know, bite me. This is what we're listening to. No I, one can, no one complains. I was an avid viewer of the Henry Rollins show, uh, but I really, really enjoyed the second season when you started to take it out internationally. And yeah. there was a particular episode uh, where you were broadcasting from Israel, and you yeah. were walking around with an, an Israeli photographer. Now, that showed me... An Ziv on Karen. Yeah. yeah, Ziv Karen showed me an on-ground reality of Israel that I could never see through the mainstream media, picking you up on your, on your point before. Now, since those broadcasts, I believe you have had some well, criticism for playing Israel or speaking in Israel from people who yeah. support the idea of a cultural boycott. I, after seeing your program, I have to admit I'm very much in two minds about it, but what to you is the compelling reason to engage and go and do the on-ground thing rather than support something like a boycott? Because I don't think any boycott hits the people that you want to hit. Mm. Like when Bruce Springsteen skips North Carolina because of House Bill 2, the bathroom bill, yeah. I get it, but I disagree. I have three shows in North Carolina this year. I can't wait to see my wonderful North Carolinian audience. They're some of the nicest people in America. It's a beautiful state. I, I used to live and there. I, and, well, there you go. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so I can't wait to be in Asheville and Durham. It's beautiful. And North people there are just heartbreakingly friendly. I can't let eight backwards rednecks and a stupid governor stop me. Because the, the governor was it McCrory. He won't get up in the morning like, ha ha, Henry Rollins skipped my state. I win. Ah ha. He doesn't know me. 
And so I said yes to a show for this year in Tel Aviv mm -hmm. and uh, immediately started getting hammered uh, by uh, pro-Palestinian groups going, how can you do that? And the guy from Pink Floyd is going to write you a letter. Ooh, here we go. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well. And they go, why are you doing that? I said, because my audience, I, I want to talk to young people and give them stories from the world. And a boycott doesn't help that situation. Mm. Uh, and I, I think the Israelis, Israeli youth are the ones I want to talk to the most. Go, look, you have mandatory military service. You, you've been told that these people are your enemy. This is about to be your country. Uh, BB is not going to be around forever. And so this is going to be yours. You really want to hurt these people? And I will have to see. And so, sadly, the promoter of who's going to bring me over there, he ripped off uh, an artist that's represented by my agent. My agent called me and said, I want you to pull this show. This guy's no good. He just ripped off a guy whose music I guarantee you, you like. But since he's not here, I won't mention him. Uh, and he said, as your agent, I want you to pull this show because we're not going to get any money. It's going to be a real cock up. I said, OK, I'll pull the show. And so NME, uh, the Jerusalem Times, they went, ha ha, we win. I'm like, no, no, I'm not cowing to you. I, I can't get ripped off. So you'd go back there with a different promoter. Yeah, I was, right. I was supposed to go back later this year, but I got busy doing other stuff. I have three films out this year, so I had to go shamelessly promote all of them. All right. so. This is a record that I wouldn't know existed if it wasn't for you. This is called Cubist Blues. It was made by Alan Vega and Alex Tilden and Ben Vaughan. Yep. And it was reissued by Light in the Attic, and it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful record. Now, Alan Vega passed away when, a couple of months ago. Uh, you announced this with the permission of the family on your website. Yeah. Why well, was he important? Well, Alan Vega was one half of a band called Suicide. Uh, forgive me if you know all this stuff, but if you don't, you should run quickly to the first Suicide record. It is mandatory listening. And his solo albums. And his solo records are incredible, and as are uh, Martin Rev. It was Alan on vocal, Martin Rev on synthesizer. They were a no-wave act called Suicide, which had a lot of influence on a lot of bands peop and people like me. Alan and I became friends in 1991 when I cold called him. I got his phone number from my age. I said, find Alan Vega's phone number. I got to meet this guy because I've been listening to him since 1979. I got his number and I call. I go, hi, I'm Henry Rollins. Oh, yeah, kid, you're the guy from Black Flag. I said, yeah, um, I'm on this Lollapalooza tour. I got like a minute off. Um, I think it was Lollapalooza. I said, can I come and meet you? And he's like, why? I said, I just want to shake your hand because I can't stop playing Deuce Avenue, your solo, new solo record. And he hesitantly let me come over. And within 10 minutes, we were buddies for life. And that's the start of this uh, great friendship that went until he passed away. And so several Saturdays ago, I'm in my office in, in L.A. working away. And the, uh, I get an email from Alan's wife, Liz Lamory, and Liz said, call me at this number as soon as you read this. I went, okay, maybe they're coming to LA, cool. So I get on, I call Liz and she's very shook up. I said, what's the matter? She's like, Alan has passed away. Mm. I said, oh, okay. I, and I, I said, I, I hate to do this. Um, is there a press release? Is anyone handling this for you? Because someone's gonna have to make an announcement. She goes, no, I go, will you let me do this? And she said, yeah, I go, I got this. Just, just like, go be, go be with your, your family. Let me handle this. I know mm -hmm. what to do. She goes, go. And so I wrote up a press release. I, I called up uh, Heidi. I said, get Lisa, our IT person. I go, get her ready. We're going to post this. Right. We've posted it. I sent it to Alan's record company, Paul Smith at Blast First in the UK. Billboard contacted me. I wrote the Billboard article. I was just kind of there for Liz so she could grieve. And I just because I can write this stuff and I, I know how to do it. And so I said, I'll, I got all this. You just be a grieving wife. And so Liz, I've been keeping in touch with Liz. She wrote me two days ago mm -hmm. and she misses her man. I, they were married a long time. And Alan was an amazing guy and an artist till the end. He just, he just finished six new canvases, six new paintings right before he got too ill to work. Wow. And uh, I'm going to go visit those canvases in October when I'm in New York. Fantastic. Yeah. One of the last things I read of his was a piece where he was talking about suicide playing in the UK in the, in the early 80s, I think. And it, it, it reminded me that we view history a particular way and the on-ground reality is always different. He, he said, in this piece, we, we went to England and post-punk kind of happened, it was happening. And for the first time, people didn't throw things at us. 
Right. We, you know, they didn't hate us, and we looked at each other and we, what do we do now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are we doing wrong? Yeah. It's almost like when you look back at the Velvets uh, or a band, a seminal band like that. Everyone thinks, oh, everyone loved them and they were amazing. Well, about thirty people in New York, right. like the Velvet oh, Underground. You know, bands that are that are legends. Yeah. Like, like there's a lot of Doors bootlegs where you people hear people jeering at them. Yeah. Like they're doing the end, like you know, you you suck, and you're like, that, that's Jim Morrison. I I knew a buddy, a, a buddy of mine was in a band called Blue Cheer, and they used oh. to they used to play with the Doors a lot. And I go, yeah. that must have been him. Like, are you kidding? Our audience was throwing stuff, just like ripped them, because like they who's this poet guy? Because they wanted like hardcore acid rock. Just it's one of those you know weird time and place things that I have this weird ability to hit now and then. The last time Suicide played was yeah. uh, in London last year, and the last time Alan did Ghost Rider, I was there and I sang it with him. Wow! And that was that. And then uh, that was the last show they did. The last time Alan was on stage was the Barbican mm -hmm. in London, and I was with him. I was in London a, a few weeks before that and actually got to meet Craig Leon, who made the Suicide Records right, right before Amazing that. producer. <laughs> yeah. One game. We've gone five minutes over time already. Oh. I, could, I could sit and talk all night, but we have to say goodbye, sadly. Well, thank you very much for the time. Thank you very much and for your you've time. you've been wonderful. Thank you for enduring this. <laughs> Henry is... <laughs> Henry is appearing tomorrow night at the State Theatre at the Arts Centre and the night after that. I'm sure he's got two very busy days of record shopping and, and he'll go and buy the scientist box set if he hasn't got it already. Got it and a already. bunch of other things. Oh, of course already. you do. We have some... Um, I'd like to thank Lauren Taylor for letting me rip this clipboard out of her hands like a true amateur. Um, you've been listening to Henry Rollins live from the Triple R Performance Space, brought to you by Sonos, the wireless hi-fi system. And we'd also like to thank our volunteers and support staff uh, Beck on sound, Archie, Tim, Lee, Jed in the studio, Elizabeth, Lauren Taylor, Patrick, Caitlin, Paul, Dylan, Annalisa and Zoran. Thank you to our technology partners, Abbott and K2 Monitoring for the sound here in the Triple R performance space paid for by your subscription dollars. And one last round of applause, applause for Mr. Henry Rollins. Thank you, Henry. Thank you.